welcome to our Harmonious Podcast Series. My name is Michael Francis Lott, and I am here with author Peter Wells, who is the author of the book Notes from the West Pole. And today we're going to be diving into his piece called Soul Consciousness. Our belief system is based on the idea that the mind can control the whole person. If I believe I am centered in my mind, then worded language and the rule of law can perhaps control me. But the whole person includes an intelligence beyond the comprehension of the mind. The mind, the worded sense, is inadequate to deal with the complexities of the whole being. The facts of life in Western culture include the imposition of a false idea, that human intelligence is under the direction of the human mind. This is so obviously absurd that one thought is sufficient to refute it. The human mind does not understand, and nor can science explain, our own uncharted brain, which functions on wavelengths beyond the reach of thought and remembered knowledge. So long as our belief system places the mind and its book of laws at the center, then awareness of our soul is obscured. Only when the mind gives up control or attempted control is there a possibility of the soul consciousness emerging. The soul is the living intelligence of the human being. Each of us is essentially an intelligent living soul. Our mind is developed after our birth and created by the soul for the benefit of human relationship. The soul is in touch with all aspects of the life being lived, including what is explainable in language and what is not, including what is conscious and what is unconscious. If we truly understand that the soul uses the mind rather than the mind uses the soul, then our belief system becomes a personal spiritual process rather than a mental compulsion of laws and punishments. The conductor of the life being lived, the user of this intelligence, the possessor of this uncharted brain is a living soul. I really appreciate this piece, Peter, because, you know, I'm an avid, uh, you know, researcher of spirituality and psychology and so on and so forth. And everywhere you look, everybody sort of has a different definition of soul, depending on, you know, who's who you're talking to. And I really appreciate this because I feel like it kind of sums it up in a more grounded, almost scientific sort of way. And so you're basically saying that soul as you're defining it, is the whole intelligence of the being, not just our limited scope of mental thought and perception. Is that, would yes. you say that's accurate? Yes. Well, everything that I'm calling the mind, the ability to think and the ability to communicate in language, to make choices and, you know, money, the rule of law, a whole bunch of stuff, all technology, that's what the mind is concerned with. But when the mind looks at the being, the human, whole human being, there's huge areas that can't be focused. Science doesn't understand the human brain, and there's billions of events to be discovered. We're so far beyond our, we live with this intelligence, so far beyond the thinking organ that we can't, even examine it we can only be it Mm. and so it really means 
uh, what it means to me is it's another consciousness. It's a separate consciousness from the one that we've been taught to learn with and to judge and to choose and to relate to the society. The inner being has this enormous um, panorama of wavelengths, and yet we're just using our mind. So how, what I'm really de defining here is that there's a scope beyond the reach of the mind, and that yet that is us. We have this brain that we don't understand. We have this whole body. We have this existence. We come from somewhere before birth, and we go somewhere after death. This energy is on another wavelength than thought. Mm. So if we can relate to this energy as a whole without actually trying to judge it or evaluate it and just let it be, I think we enter into another consciousness. What that is is, is sometimes called enlightenment mm. because the, the intuition and the instinct of the being is able to address its own condition. Rather than being subject to the machinations of the mind and the, the ruler, the parliament, the church, the different kinds of teachings that we have to absorb, rather than that, what we're, I think, better off doing is paying attention to this whole intelligence, which I'm calling the soul. I can't think of what else it could be. But so it's defined as the soul is not quite a scientific existence because it can't be fully defined by the mind. Mm. But we can at least acknowledge that it exists beyond the mind and that our own being exists beyond the mind. We cannot think about who we are. We can just be it. So that understanding allows for us to have a, a consciousness that is not governed by thought, not governed by law, not governed by money. It's simply an, a, a, an aptitude, if you like, of the whole being. Mm. Yeah, this is really interesting, you know, and for myself, as you say this, I'm becoming aware of, as I go about my day-to-day -day life, how so much of my energy is fixated on um, relating to the culture and like my grocery list or the jobs that are right before me that I need to do or, you know, maybe what people think of me and just like all these kind of thoughts that are kind of just nonsense and my whole experience is sort of condensed and limited to those thoughts while there's so much more happening in myself and in my reality that I'm completely oblivious to, right? Right. And so my question to you now is how does someone make that transition from their reality kind of being collapsed into this mental chatter into this wider scope of, of experience and enlightenment? How do we make that transition into soul consciousness? Well, we have to realize that we're already in it. The baby is born with it, into it. Then we add all kinds of teachings and all kinds of relationships to the child's empty mind and the identity begins to be developed. And so we then have a, a, a really amazing chore. We actually have to create an identity in order to relate to the society. But our, our greatest ability is actually beyond the mind. Our greatest ability is to be this amazing organism that is alive here on this planet and is trying to figure out how best to live. And the best way to live is not, it turns out, as far as I'm concerned, it's not about following rules. It's about exploring one's own consciousness, one's own being, and that one's perceptions need to be listened to and addressed. What we have now is we have... Uh, Conflicted teachings, friend and enemy, good and evil. So the mind becomes totally involved with sorting all that stuff out. Is this good or is this evil? Are you a friend or are you an enemy? That becomes the chatter of the mind. But we don't need that. 
I'm suggesting that, that those ideas are no longer really favorable to the being. They put us into a divided way of life. We defend ourselves. We try to avoid guilt, blame, fear, all kinds of stuff that are generated by these ideas because the culture has penalties, has punishments, has retribution, has uh, an attitude towards the person that distracts them from the actual wholeness of the soul. This is not really a religious idea. I'm not suggesting this has anything to do with a religion. I'm suggesting that this is just a natural part of us that we have to encounter. If we're going to look at our upbringing and our conditioning as something that has been, you know, foisted on us, or if we realize that it isn't working, if we can see that the governmental system and the power over the person is not, is not working, then we can awaken to the consciousness of the soul because the soul is doing the whole thing. And the, the mind, the thinker, is the student of that, not the leader of it. Mm, I love that. Wow, that's very well said. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. What, one of the things that's coming to me is that as we make this transition from sort of a limited scope of perception to the soul awareness is it seems like that there's a real shift from directing our energy to our thoughts and our mental chatter to really opening ourselves up to the world of sensation and being in the body and our emotions and our feelings. And these are a lot of things that, uh, you know, people tend to deny on a day-to-day -day basis in order for them to fulfill their obligations to go to the job that they need to do. Um, it's very mental. It's very thought oriented. It's very revolved around compartmentalization and judging good and bad and so on and so forth. And in the midst of doing that, we we tend to kind of push aside or suppress um, our own emotional realities, you know. And I, I really think that our emotions uh, are the gateway to the unconscious mind, you know, and it's really kind of that I feel like is, is, is how we step into soul consciousness. It's really coming into those parts of ourselves that we've been taught to reject and to exactly right. deny. So, Or at least to evaluate and to stay in a mental attitude towards it and where blame and guilt and all kinds of atrocities exist. And the person can feel that they're trapped by these values that are foisted on us. We've been told, you know, we've, we have the talk about the original innocence mm -hmm. instead of original sin. Right. You know, we are a wide awake intelligence without the judgment that the mind has been taught to foist. You know, we're, we're actually innocent beings and we're alive in a world that has been developed and we're trying to find a way out of this madness that is actually happening. Uh, the madness is exemplified by, we call this a democracy. And democracy is supposedly a free and equal people, and that the government is with the consent of the people. In fact, though, our government uh, acts against the person. It punishes. It commits wars. It, it makes people very uncomfortable. So we're, we're messed up. That isn't the real purpose of government. The real purpose of government is to manage what we share not to divide our consciousness, not to have us be at war and in conflict all the time. So how do we extricate ourselves from that conditioning, from that idea? It's been hundreds, thousands of years in development, but now we can see with all the world wars and with the incredible suffering that the wars create and with the stupid punishments that our governments are so fond of perpetrating that we're in a mess so we have to straighten it out. And the straightening out in the person is to f fulfill the soul within us, right. to, to, to locate it, to understand that there is more in me than I can think about. And yet I am that, and that I can listen to that. I can f follow that because it's true. I can self-correct, but there isn't a power outside of me that has that real power. The real power is within me. Right. 
Yeah, and going back to kind of the beginning of the talk where we addressed this mental sense, it really feels like the mental sense is created、um, by the self as an attempt to、uh, relate to the external world and strictly dealing with with just our external relationships. And it's really interesting because right now I'm currently facilitating a class on developing intuition, and the whole class is basically centered around retracting our focus from the external and placing it on our own internal sensations,、uh, being aware of one's dreams, for instance, and being aware of one's innermost impressions and visions and inner、uh, emotions and the feelings and all these things. And so.、Um, And it's totally fascinating, and I, I think intuition is very relevant for what we're talking about here because it is kind of a, a an aspect of soul consciousness. And so, you know, basically, how one gets in touch with their intuition or the reality of the soul is really paying attention to their own inner sensations, their own inner realities, because it's in these inner realities, in our inner visions, in our emotions. In our dreams, where our true genius abides, that tries to communicate to us, that tries to let us know and steer us in the direction of its fullest expression. Yeah, that's a personal understanding that one can have. One can be, I mean, not only intuition but instinct、mm -hmm. is a direct connection to this organism. Right. And the instinct is really there for that purpose, and it is the soul that is having that. Now, it may not be possible that what the person wants to do with that instinct, it may be antisocial, it may be the feelings that are, are being felt, or it may be considered immoral, or whatever. But nevertheless, that's that's a priority for the being. And the being has to absorb that in order to fully feel its own wholeness. You can't deny any part of this existence in order to be whole.、Hmm. There is no denial possible. The more we deny, the more we occupy the mind with restrictions. So, even though we may or may not do whatever, the denial is is not a true response. To the wholeness, right. So, would you basically say that in order, just as a basic premise, to tune into this soul consciousness, we have to release denial from ourselves, and we have to learn how to accept those aspects of ourselves that have been rejected? Would you say that that's basically the the, the formula for well, well, that's, for it? Yeah, that's all absolutely, but that's within the mind. That's within the thinking process.、Hmm. So we can change our thinking, but And, and we can change our behavior. We can't change who we are. We can't change our soul. And this living soul that we happen to be is already steeped in centuries and centuries of existence. And it it knows it knew how to make this body. How do we make this body? We haven't got a clue on how to make this body. It wasn't us that made it. Yeah, but apparently <laughs> it was though. You know, apparently、uh, there's a designer. That is perpetuating this existence through giving us rebirth and re rejuvenation, or actually just the、um, acceptance of ourselves as a whole. That's all that the mind can do. If the mind will just do that, then we can pursue the the real instinct and in, intuitive parts of our being, and be、um, much more awake. Hmm. Yeah, and so how is this process for you specifically in making that transition from that sort of、uh, limited mental scope into soul consciousness? How did that look like for you? Well, <laughs> it really came about through a, a psychedelic experience. Oh, interesting. Okay.、Um, but what it, what it was was a confirmation. I'd already had this. Feeling of <clears throat> of being this vast, being a part of this vast existence, that I wasn't limited just to my identity. There was a greater realm that we are already living in, and so that came、uh, when I took.、Uh, it was confirmed by taking LSD.、Hmm. Um, however,、um, it, 
I don't think LSD is necessary for it. I think that what what LSD does is it for a limited period of time, it shuts down the thinking mind. The thinking mind is um, rested. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a meditation where you're not thinking, and yet the brain, the intelligence of the whole being, is still working. And we can, and that's without judgment. It's without real choice. It just simply is. Mm-hmm. So, as we, you know, we wake up to uh, this other consciousness, this soul consciousness. Um, the, the judgments, the choices, the evaluations, all kind of fall away, and the uniqueness of who we are becomes the operating principle. Mm. So. In effect, if we were to now be able to go into soul consciousness wherever we like, it's also kind of like the zone in sports. Right. It's right, where right. you don't have to think in order to be complete. And the, the thinking organ, the mind, is quiet even as the being is going through its own wholeness. You can see it in sports very easily where a player will suddenly be free. They won't have to calculate. They just go in a rhythmic flow. And uh, that's a part of existence. And the soul, I believe, is the generator of that. Or the We can't put a name on it, really. We can't really define it because it's just happening all the time whether or not we think. Hmm. And we can definitely see it in children and babies. Oh, yeah. Um, I really appreciate you bringing up that whole notion of being in the zone. Uh, Recently, I was just watching a a TED Talk, and I can't remember who was delivering the TED Talk, but it was the psychologist that was doing studies on happiness and Mm -hmm. the factors in determining happiness in people's lives. And he was looking at money, and he was looking at, uh, you know, career and all these different things. And what he uncovered, or what he felt like he uncovered, was one's overall happiness in life was dependent on that feeling of being in the zone. And if they could direct their focus in their lives to being in that place of being in the zone and being engaged as much as possible, then that was the determining factor of one's overall general happiness. So... I thought that was a really interesting thing to... Well, it's also uh, beyond the duality. It's beyond the division. It's beyond the evaluation of the self in terms of beautiful, ugly, rich, poor. All that stuff is just stuff kind of circulating in the social atmosphere. But once we accept ourselves as a whole with whatever that is, you know, without judgment, without preferring one situation over another, then we have a capability of going into this wholeness where there is no judgment, where there is no possibility of it. You know, it just, we are it itself. Mm -hmm. We are here. We don't need the judgment. The society has created it, and for good reason. You know, lots of good reasons for it, but the essence of who we are, the deepest feelings we have, the real... uh, purpose of this life is in our soul is in that inner being that is really living the life that can't be defined mm. that can't be measured yeah and i'm i'm huge into the the healing world and so on and so forth and i really think that at the foundation of healing just period it comes to the release of judgment and self-acceptance well know? because healing the ancient uh, word for healing was a uh, whole, really, but mm. holy. Oh. The word holy, wholeness, heal, health, all have the same stem. Oh, they all have the same. And whole was pronounced in the Middle Ages, was pronounced holy, with the E, an accent on the E. So when we're being whole, we're being holy, and we're being healthy. Oh, I love that. And, um, you know, I, I grew up Christian, and so the, the whole figure of, of Christ and Jesus was something that was completely surrounding my childhood. And as I get older, I kind of have a different take on it. And, um, you know, Jesus was so connected to these qualities of acceptance and compassion. And the way that I look at the notion of Christ is that Christ is that which heals through acceptance, that which makes one whole. Mm-hmm. So. 
Well, here we are. <laughs> okay, well, that's a, a good place to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Peter. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Michael. All right. Until next time, guys, have a beautiful week. See you next time on Harmonious. Stay connected with us and get the book Notes from the West Pole on our website, www.harmonious.com. And that's spelled Harmony Us with a Y. Thanks for listening.